The next presentation is called Game Changers in Water Conservation. And we're privileged privilege to have two, uh, two presenters today to dive into this, this topic. Right, we don't have one on stage because she's actually so interested in John Petrie's slides that she wants to watch for the first part. And then she's going to join us on stage. So Susan Snezzi is the editorial director and publisher of Metropolis Magazine, hugely respected in the industry. I'm sure you've heard her name. John Petrie is master kitchen and, master kitchen and bath designer and master bath designer. Um, C, the, the acronym CMKBD, yes, I should know that. Um, he is the principal of Mother Hubbard's Custom Cabinetry, and he's going to speak, they're both going to speak about game changing ideas for addressing water conservation in the home. Uh, the two rooms that are responsible for the most water use, let's face it, is the, is the kitchen and the bath. And Susan and John are going to talk about uh, how to merge. Uh, how that water conservation philosophy um, can merge with practicality in your actual home. So it's going to be a fascinating, fascinating discussion. Thank you for joining us. And I'm going to turn it over to John Petrie. Thank you, Leanne. So you all are either really interested in water conservation, which I hope is the case, or you just want to get off your feet uh, this afternoon. And I hope uh, that it's because you're interested in conserving what Susan and I both feel is uh, life's most precious resource, and that's water. Every day, I guarantee you, you take it for granted. Every single day. And probably even more so that you're here in this resort community because uh, maybe at home you pay for your water, but here you don't. You go to the hotel and maybe that 10 minute shower that you take at home turns into 20 minutes um, because it's not your water and you take it for granted. Um, there's only so much water on this planet, and it's been the same amount of water, quite frankly, since the conception of the planet, since the beginning of, beginning of time. What has changed on this planet is the number of people all fighting for that amount of water. See if I can make this work. Which button? Oh. Technology. Huh? Hey. No problem. So today, less than one percent of the water that we have is fresh and available for human use. Just 1%, right? Nearly 1.2 billion people on this planet today lack um, clean water lacks, uh, and have access to safe drinking water. It's estimated that by what, the year 2025, just 10 years from now, maybe nine years from now, actually, uh, as many as 3.4 billion people on this planet will face a water scarcity. The world's population is expected to increase approximately 74 million people per year through, the, through 2017. And today, right, we have 6.8 billion. In 2010, we have over 7 billion people on the planet today. 7 billion. Nearly 9 billion by 2050. The average American uh, consumes or the amount of water used, 3.9 trillion gallons of water are used in the United States a month. 3.9 trillion gallons. Right? The average American family uses about 400 gallons of water per day. So how do they use that gallon? How do they use that water? Well, they take showers. Some of us longer showers than others. <laughs> right? We brush our teeth. Some of us turn the water off when we brush our teeth. Some don't. We shave. We wash dishes by hand, some of us. Dishwasher, right? About nine to 12 gallons. And we flush toilets, about five to seven gallons. One of the resources that, um, that I use when I, when I talk and we just think about water is uh, the drought monitor map. You can go online and you can look at that drought monitor map. 
uh, at any given, any given uh, time. It's updated on a weekly basis. But what you'll see is the state of California almost 100% in an extreme drought. You say, well, it doesn't matter. I don't live in California. It matters. Where does the vast majority of our food come from in the winter months? How about California? Right? That water is a very precious resource in California. And as a result, I guarantee you, you see it in your grocery prices at the grocery store and your food prices going up. We're at the industry's premier leading show, right? At KBiz, Kitchen and Bath, uh, Kitchen and Bath Industry Show and IBS, the International Builder Show. And it's a, a great venue for you uh, to, to learn and to consider what products you can use to conserve water. Um, primarily, the bathroom is what I want to focus on for our, our talk here this afternoon. And that's uh, the room that uses the most amount of water. 30% uh, toilets use 30% of the home's indoor water use. Showers, 17% and lab faucets, 15%, right? Three combined for, on average, 41 gallons per person per day in the home. So toilets. So as you're here and you're on the show floor, there's wonderful manufacturers out there, and I won't name them, but I would encourage you to go to look at their product and to see. I spent some time today in one manufacturer's showroom, or one manufacturer's booth that has a whole series of toilets that flush just one gallon of water. One gallon of water. And they've come out with dual, dual flush toilets that produce or flush 0.8 gallons and one gallon of water. So dual flush, liquid, 0.8 gallons, solid, one. Today there's products out there in the industry that we call HET, or high efficiency toilets. It's a low, low flow alternative. Back in the early 90s, when the federal government came out through uh, the EPA, they said you can only flush 1.6 gallons of water. We were flushing about 3.5 gallons of water at that time. And those toilets, if you were in the industry, they didn't work, did they? Nope, they didn't work. Today, I assure you that those toilets work, and they're flushing less than the 1.6 gallons per flush that the EPA allows, it, allows the manufacturer to do. That's 1.28 down to as little as 0.8 in some manufacturers. There's dual flush models we talked about a little bit. And they do work. In 2002, um, the industry, the scientific industry came out and developed a, a testing, a, a realistic testing uh, product called MAP testing. It's not testing a Google map to see if you can get from spot A to spot B, but map testing actually tests the manufacturer's toilets. It is a voluntary program. Manufacturers are not required to submit their product to this testing, to have their toilets tested. So they send their toilet to the manufacturer and they actually test it uh, to make sure that it's working with a, uh, with a product. I'm gonna give you a website and you can actually go on and look at it to see how they do it. The best part about that, oh, the website didn't show up, I'm sorry. It's map-testing.com. The best part of, the, um, of that website is the fact that as a designer and a specifier, you have the ability to go on there and see their database and see what the manufacturer's toilets and their models are and do they work? And do they effectively remove the waste from the home? None of us want to sell that product if it doesn't work. We don't want the callbacks. We want water efficient, good quality, good style product that actually removes the waste. And I would encourage you to use that map testing website to see how that works. We also have shower heads. What do we want in our shower? I mean, we want power, right? I, um, when I give this talk to local chapters, I embed a video that uh, is from um, Seinfeld episode where Kramer goes out on the, on the market, on the black market to buy a shower head because his superintendent inf installed low flow alternatives that didn't work. And so he goes out and buys the Commando 350 and at the end of the show he just gets blown right out of the, out of the shower stall. But we want power. The federal government says we can do 2.5 gallons per minute in our shower head. I will tell you, and you go out and you look, I was there in, in another manufacturer's booth today, um, they're doing less than that 2.5. They're down to as little as, as um, 
2.2, 1.5, and even 1.75, 1.5 gallons per water. And they're doing it in, in ways that some of them interject air into the uh, water head or into the shower head to change the uh, molecule, the size of the water droplet. Some of them are doing it with a mechanical uh, mechanism um, that actually uh, excites the water and, and changes the size of the droplet as it comes out. And again, you're here, they're there. It's whether it's Moen or Delta or Kohler or Don's, they're all there and I would encourage you to get out and talk to them and ask them what's new and what innovations do they have that can help you um, sell a, a faucet that conserves water or a toilet that conserves water to your homeowner. WaterSense, I don't know if any of you know what WaterSense is, but WaterSense is an EPA government program that actually labels toilets and faucets uh, out there. And many of our manufacturers, well, all of them actually, um, strive for that label, that WaterSense label, because it shows that they are actually meeting and or exceeding the uh, EPA requirements for uh, conserving water. Right? Remember early shower heads, they just didn't work. We would go out and we would take the shower head or the, the restrictors out of them. Today, if you did that, the flow rate would actually be uh, detrimental to the enjoy, enjoyable experience of the shower. And last, in the bathroom, we have faucets. The technology in the faucet is really just in the tiniest little tip on the end, and that's the aerator. But that aerator um, is what conserves all the water in, in the, sh in the uh, lab faucet. So we have aerators today that are be is, uh, the, is below the 2.2 EPA um, government standard. You can reduce that down to as little as 0.5 gallons per minute. So those are the three main items within the bathroom that I wanted to focus on. We're at a great spot to be able, for you to be able to go out and see those. Just in the couple of hours uh, after the opening session until I had to come over here, I was able to see about a half a dozen different booths to be able to, to see some of their new product. And I was encourage you throughout the rest of the show to get out on the show floor to see what those manufacturers have so that you can um, experience them for yourself and take them back to your clients back home. Susan? Thank you. Thank you, John. So uh, I, I took the, uh, the sort of design point of view since uh, Metropolis deals with design. And I don't know. You got it. Do I get it? Yep. Whoops. OK. Nope. We went too far. Help. <laughs> Anyway, um, uh, one of the things that I wanted to tell you is that before, before I come to speak at any event, I usually look at uh, what comes to me on my computer screen and uh, relevant to the talk that we're doing. So uh, one of the things that I saw there um, was the, um, the, first of all, as John said, uh, water is a global concern. And then secondly, there's this really interesting uh, information that's coming from the EPA, for instance, and the EPA's announcement that they gave a grant for $44 million to uh, the states of, uh, of um, Arizona and Nevada for their water, um, improving their water quality and the infrastructure. So the EPA, the federal government is on this, local governments are on this, developers are part of this. This is a much bigger conversation. The bathroom and the kitchen are very much part of it because everybody has to do their part. But it's really interesting to, maybe I'm not gonna have a presentation. I don't know where it went. I've been plagued by bad technology. Are you sure you have it? I didn't say that. I just, I just. So. Okay, well, one of the things that I wanted to talk to you about, which looked really interesting, is that um, there are designers working with um, uh, public officials, with, with all kinds of uh, uh, people to figure out how to uh, create um, new urban plans. For instance, I had a really cool picture of the Brooklyn waterfront. 
the Brooklyn waterfront, uh, which was uh, after Sandy, as you know, it was compromised and uh, there was a lot of talk about resiliency and how to make it all happen, how to make it all work, because the next storm surge is coming. We know that it's coming. Cities and uh, towns and communities on the water are facing this. It's either too much or too little, and it's not the right kind. So that's what we're talking about. And so the Brooklyn waterfront had a really interesting thing that happened after that terrible example with Sandy, is that um, the city and the state and the developers, the building owners, the architects, the landscape architects, the whole design community came together and started talking about how do we build on the waterfronts. So they did everything from uh, raising buildings to raising utilities within the buildings to landscaping so that the landscapes wouldn't be destroyed, but they were water-friendly landscaping. So there was um, one of some of the things that they they were talking about, which is really interesting. I, they have this whole book of instructions. And uh, one of the things they encourage everybody to do is capture, captured stone water uh, can be purified and used in household uh, functions. So that's a really cool thing. Um, the, the other part, I mean, there's, there's like a huge selection of things that in this book that they produced which is a really strong guideline for waterfront. Uh, the waterfront pollution, uh, light pollution, is really dangerous uh, because a jellyfish uh, migrate to the, to the uh, shores. And as you know, if you've been on those waterfront with the jellyfish swimming around you, you are not, your kids are gonna be very unhappy and so will you because they will be stinging everyone. So you have to be very careful about the light you choose so that the water you swim in and the other aquatic animal, animal swim in are going to be really, really um, um, safe. Um, I think, uh, for instance, they talk about um, use water-based renewable energy systems around water. So you have uh, tidal wave energy to supplement uh, all the energy systems that you have. So uh, these things are on, on every, every kind of scale. Um, I had a great shot from China, great shot. I don't know where it went, but it disappeared. Um, it was actually China has an enormous issue with their water purity. Uh, just like every other industrialized, industrializing nation, they really had a very, very bad experience with spilling all kinds of uh, chemicals into the water, uh, runoff from farms, from industry, from all of those places. So they are now looking at rebuilding and building really interesting uh, developments around uh, in water areas. So. I found this great shot from Qingdou, China, as a, for a horticultural exhibition, uh, which was uh, obviously it, it taught local people to uh, and visitors to uh, figure out how to use uh, how to grow food, how to use water, uh, how to uh, understand natural landscapes, and of course, what the what the development has is these wonderful views of water everywhere. It's built on a a lagoon that people can enjoy and at the same time understand how the water functions in agriculture. Um, in India, there was another great picture. I wish I could share my memory with you, but uh, there is this really interesting thing that it, uh, uh, solar irrigation pumps were devised by farmers uh, who worked with engineers uh, who actually drove all their irrigation pumps by the sun. So where there was no fossil fuels being used. And uh, apparently there are some 80 climate villages in the Gujarat version of the Punjab. So you can, you can see that there, there are these amazing things that are happening everywhere at every scale, at every, every um, scale of wealth and, uh, and in terms of numbers too. Um, What's really interesting is, is that uh, these communities are making, growing food without polluting the environment. So they're using clean energy to uh, capture clean, capture water and use the water to, to grow their foods. In Las Vegas, in Las Vegas, here was something that 
I really wanted you to see. And it is, it is one of the most interesting projects I have come across, and it's truly a game changer. There are two young architects work, who were working at Yale Architecture School, and they decided to study Las Vegas water system. As you know, those of you who might be living here or who visit here often, there are periodic downpours, the water disappears, and uh, then there's drought. And, and there's an enormous use of water with all this new building here. So how do you begin to capture the, the water that falls so that you can actually rely on the, on the water that comes into the city and not tap Lake Mead? And John has some really interesting figures on where Lake Mead is. Uh, I'll ask him just in a few minutes. But what they did was they designed this beautiful concrete infrastructure system that would be all around the city that would collect the water as it falls into cisterns underneath this gorgeous patterned concrete and uh, uh, people could look at where the water went so the idea was really to figure out how to design infrastructure water infrastructure or other infrastructure that that reveals uh, the uh, to the citizens who pay for it what it is and how it functions. I think it's really important to know how something works in order to make the right decisions about it. So they, uh, these two were, were really, really interesting. The, and then, of course, I had this film, which I want to give you a YouTube um, uh, to, for you to look at, because this is really, really cool. It's um, called Vibia, and it is a water system uh, designed by these young people who are um, using um, uh, um, space technology and medical technology to produce the, the shower system that is a mist, but a mist, they have the, the video that shows the, the people of all kinds of, you know, large hair, small hair, male, female, using this shower. It's really a mist. I didn't think that people got clean from it but they are showing that they are, they are getting clean from this uh, great system. And they uh, got their first financing from, uh, uh, from uh, um, what is that, uh, Kickstarter. Kickstarter. So, so anyway, that's, that's, uh, that's what we missed the visu visually. And I'm really sorry about that because I worked very hard to put that together. But, uh, now for John, what is going on in Las Vegas? Because I think you have, uh, you, you have some numbers here that are really interesting, that are indicative of our urban settlement and what kind of pressures we're putting on our water system. Sure. I think you know, Las Vegas gets over 90% of its water from Lake Mead. Lake Mead is at a capacity level of about 38%. This means it's over 60% depleted. Um, I don't know how many of you actually flew in, um, but uh, as I flew in again this year, I was able, we flew over Lake Mead. And you see the bathtub ring is what we call it, and it's, it is enormous. Um, in other words, where the water used to be. In, um, in 1971, when Lake Mead was first uh, opened to provide water to this city, there was about 197,000 residents that live in Las Vegas, that draw from Lake Mead. Do you know how many there are today? Over two billion, million, million. million. over two million. Over yeah. two million people. You know how many visitors come to Las Vegas annually? About 40 million people. And they take really long showers. They take long showers. It's not their water. So, uh, and, it's, and it's, it's a shame, but I think they do. I think they just yeah. take it for granted. Yeah. Um, and so as a result, I mean, in um, July of this year, Las, uh, Lake Mead um, was at an all-time low in, in um, the water level that was there. And that has a um, serious and significant impact um, for this city and for the other communities that um, uh, Lake Mead is the water source for. So one of the interesting thing is that uh, we, te we, I mean, we are here at a very specialized place where we should be talking about all these issues, but uh, kitchen and bath use a, uh, a portion of the water 
and uh, it's it's much more significant in other areas of use. So, what are the what are the biggest water hogs that are out there that really need to put their house in order? I mean, certainly. I mean, when we think about the amount of fresh water that's on this planet, um, you know, agriculture uses seventy percent. All right. So, our farmers are um, and and agriculture and planting for crops and whatnot use seventy percent of that fresh water. Then we manufacture stuff, right? So we, we're manufacturers, whether it's the countertops or the cabinets or the products that we're here to buy, that uses 20, um, 22% of that water. It's us as residents, as, as human beings, that use 8% of that amount of water. But, but then when you think about it, us as human beings use all of that water because we eat the fruit, we eat, you know, so I mean, I think that's, that's one of the issues that we have to th teach ourselves how to do is think of the whole system. Because if we fix the water supply for the farms and don't deal with the kitchens and baths and don't right. deal with the car washing and don't deal with all the other uses because we think that we have done something good, we haven't fixed anything really, basically. Yeah. No, you're right. You mentioned car washes and um, I used to think that I was being pretty decadent by going to the car wash, except you know what the car wash does? It recycles the water. We don't recycle our water at home when we wash it in the driveway. We use the water and just it's just it's gone. But the car wash, they recycle that water, so it's being reused and reused and reused. So, so you have been around this uh, this uh, group and this uh, really interesting organization for a long time, and I know that the manufacturers are really trying. I see some really really smart things through technology, through materials, through through a real understanding where they are and how they are, uh, uh, you know, designing their products. So how can, what, what is your view of the client uh, in, in receiving this information? Is there, I think it, it's, it's changed a great deal and you, you guys may want to uh, pipe up in this because I, I'd love to hear what your experiences are. Well, what's your view of the client in terms of water? Um. I think that if you, we bring the message to them and we talk to them about water and water conservation and we can show them products that are highly stylized, that are beautiful, that, um, that aren't um, uh, sterile, that, that have style to them, um, they're willing to listen and they're, they're eager to hear um, what we have to offer and what the industry has to offer with that technology. Um, you know, they were very scared in the early 90s, w whether it was their shower heads that we were messing with or their toilets that wouldn't flush. Um, and uh, so we came out with a product that actually now works, but it is, it's highly stylized. You can go into any of these manufacturers booths and see the beautiful products that meet um, and exceed the EPA standards. Um, but to go, I think if you have that conversation with them, oftentimes I find that it's, myself that brings it up to the client when we're in there and they're talking about remodeling their bathroom. We talk about replacing their water closet with a, a new one, even though that may be fairly new, but one that's a high efficiency water closet that uh, is flushing one gallon or 1.28 gallons. They're eager to listen. So do they ever call the kids into this discussion? Because the kids are really aware of this. I mean, the kids are very much environmentalist and socially active, and, and they really are interested in the earth. They are, it is theirs, the 21st century is theirs, and they are gonna, uh, you know, uh, uh, get do, all of this. Yeah, I do find the younger generation, my younger clients are more um, sensitive to it and more eager to embrace and, and to uh, accept what we're talking about there. Um, you know, there's, we're, we're here, we have the Kitchen and Bath Show, one of the things that I love about what, what these two um, organizations did when we co-located the show is we put the whole house envelope together. And so I had the opportunity as a kitchen and bath specialist, um, but to go into the home builder side and talk, you talked about uh, uh, reclaiming water. And uh, you can go to the home builder show and you can see water bladders that home builders can build and, and um, into your home and design into the, whether it's a crawl space or the basement of your home uh, or under a deck, wherever that is, but there's bladders that capture rainwater runoff. 
So it rains, now that hits your roof, goes into your gutters, goes into that bladder. You have that water now available to use for agriculture, for watering your grass, for watering your plants. Uh, that water can also be filtered, can be used um, for flushing your toilets. Um, that's another part where we have gray water applications where you know we can use um, gray water, water that we've already used within the home that comes back down into the basement, is filtered, and then used a second time to flush toilets in your home. So the, uh, I mean, I think you mentioned when we when we talked before that. Uh, there's just so much water that's available to us. 1% of the Earth's water is available for human use yes. and consumption. And so we're not making any more, although it feels like we're making a lot more because of the, the enormous powerful storms that we have. But it's all there kind of exchanging. The sea is rising up and drowning us, but it's the, the water is salty and brackish and we can't live on it. I mean, we, there, there is no new water on this planet to speak of. So, um, but what there are are new people and we all are fighting for that precious resource. Um, Sure, there's, you can, um, you can clean the salt water. What is that called? Um, desalinate. Desalinate. You can desalinate the salt water. I don't know if any of you have tasted it. It's okay, but it's certainly not something that, um, that I think tastes good. Um, but it's also very, very, very expensive. I mean, millions and millions of dollars to build desalination plants. State of California and Southern California is building one now off, in, off the coast of San Diego. I forget what the number of millions of dollars that it is, but it's needed because the Colorado River, when it gets down there, is all, all but gone. dry. Yeah. It's all but dry. Yeah, so, but I mean, I think that's one of the issues is that desalination also has its byproduct, which mm -hmm. is the, the brine that uh, is left over. Are they, uh, have you heard of any reuse of that and any, any uh, uh, sort of safe way of disposing that? Because I think that's one of the issues. It's like, it sounds to me like uh, 19th century thinking. It's like, we're going to get this. We're going to forget the, the problems that we cause because right now we need a drink of water. And you, we're, we're creating more problems than we're solving. So. It's the reuse, rethinking. I mean, what have we learned from the space program? Those guys are up there in space, you know, for months and months. And uh, how are they, what sort of liquids are they drinking? Are they uh, drinking their uh -huh. urine? I mean, they must be because they, they have to recycle every speck of water that there is. Yeah. All good questions, and that I don't know. But I mean, there is, what's interesting about this, that there is a lot of science out there that can help. I mean, I, I was just reading about the Columbia Water uh, uh, Research Group, yeah. and they're very interested in, in looking at cities and looking at what they use and how they use it, and then looking at the metrics of all the, all the big data that's coming around right now and mining that big data to understand certain aspects of water use. So I think the, the, the information is out there, the ideas out there, the interest is out there, and I think it, it really is now the question of the consumer saying that I'm not gonna buy anything that isn't as efficient as I'd like it to be. I, uh, you know, there's no excuse anymore because efficient doesn't mean ugly. Right, exactly. Efficient is beautiful. Yep. And, uh, and efficient is also really uh, uh, convenient to use. I mean, it's not, but, but, but then, you know, so I go to an airport bathroom and, you know, there are all those sensors that are not working. So who's responsible for that? That's a good question. I, I mean, I, yeah, I, you know, I would like, that's what I mean. It's like we have these systems and then we don't follow up. It's like there's no maintenance. It's like the, the maintenance for, the, for public services is somehow there, but not really. I mean, we think we build it and then we can go away. But I think, again, this idea of connecting everything to everything else is somehow we need to somehow figure this one out. But it just goes back to show you in my mind that we take it for granted. It's, it's always been there. We've had it every day. I don't know any of you, I, I, I know some of you, but I guarantee you, none of you can probably tell me when the last time was you turned your faucet on and water didn't come out, right? It's been there every time. 
And, and as a result, it's, yeah. it's unfortunate. We do. We take it for granted. Now, we're in the United States. Flint, Michigan. Have any of you heard of that story that's happening there? Oh, the lead. You know? I mean, you know, they take it for granted. Now yeah. what's happened? They changed their water source, and now they, have a prop now they can't drink the water. So, so and this is the, the United answer? States. This isn't the third world. What country. are they doing? So what are they doing? Because they can't clean that up very quickly. So yeah. do they ship in the water from somewhere? I'm else? not sure. I'm, I'm sure that that's probably they what they're doing. They have to ship it in. They're yeah. shipping in bottled yeah. water and tankers of water and. And then yeah. adding adding the uh, fuel energy to it and polluting with the fuel. I mean, it's like everything is kind of uh, working in a circular mode. So we yeah. have these drastic measures for something that shouldn't have happened in the first place. I would imagine that those factories are not letting out the lead like they used to. And I think because the EPA has been uh, uh, really on, the, on their tails. So there's more of that, more legislation, more rewards for good works, more of that. But it really isn't, uh, you know, it's not, not second nature to us. I mean, is there, is there a reason why when you brush your teeth, you don't have a little cup there to hold the water for that moment that you brush your teeth so you can rinse it instead of keep the water running? I mean, what, who, who said that you have to keep the water running? So um, what can this show and this group of not just manufacturers, because I really do believe the manufacturers are on the case, but what can this group do individually and collectively to figure out this water situation because it is, it's not getting better, it's getting worse. I mean, there are all these wonderful actions, individual actions, local actions, but then we see what's going on around us. The, you know, we don't, we don't collect the floodwaters. We don't know how to do that. We don't purify the, uh, the, the uh, floodwaters. We don't use them. We don't have the infrastructure because we can't build them. So how do, where do we go away w with some sort of folk hopeful action here that we can all say, this, this is where I can do something? It's a great question, I, I, and I don't know the answer to it. I wish I did. Um, I think it's going to take, you know, uh, uh, an experience that none of us really hope is going to happen, or you know, for for that to happen, and you turn the faucet on and you don't have that, or you can't take a shower, um, and when you get to experience that, I think um, that's when maybe it will become real to to us, and and we stop to take that for granted. I, you know, f I have to tell you, my experience to where um, I really became passionate about this was, was just a, uh, was a service organization trip to El Salvador where I went to, to uh, provide one faucet in the middle of a village of 40 homes. One faucet, 40 homes. In those 40 homes, they had about eight to 10 people in a house. Right? So 400 some odd people, one faucet in the middle of town and that was their source of drinking water. And I came back and I said, this is, this is crazy. I mean, I design rooms and, and, uh, and I, I have four or five faucets in my own home and I designed the rooms within the home that use all this water. And it just, it, just, uh, it kind of hit me and I said, you know, I can help to make a little bit of a difference um, through talking about water and through talking to to my clients about water and, and how we can use products that will conserve water. Um, but I think that's what it's going to take. It's going to take each one of us, unfortunately, to have that experience. I hope that that's not the case. You know, I read um, some books and some experts expect that the next world war will be over water. Over water, yeah. All right. Well, water and food. Yeah. Because if there's no water, there's no food. There's no food. So, uh, and uh, there's no, I mean, uh, we, it's a vicious cycle. So uh, I think that here in America, I think we could create something really amazing because you, uh, to think about water and air and air and sunlight as resources and really think about them to figure out how we use, uh, use them the best and how do we, not uh, throw it away. And that, that's a, a kind of a change of mind 
that that is beginning to happen with the younger generation because the kids are very much aware of it, but I don't think we can wait for them. I mean, look at what happened in California. The agriculture dried up. The, I mean, the, the, our food supply has been compromised. Yeah. So, and then, uh, you know, so I mean, this is, this is not going away. So I think, I think maybe the good news is that we all can do something and I think, but I think I don't want the water situation to turn into the recycling uh, response. Because that was like, okay, so I recycled my paper, I'm doing the right thing. Yeah, I think that's fine, but think, uh, I mean, we now know that recycling can be a really messy, dirty affair that is not really uh, as safe and as clean as we think that it should be. So it needs to be upcycled, needs to thought about it in a different way. So. We, we can't jump onto these simple solutions, but I think wherever there's a documentation that something, something is performing better, then I think, and I think the, that water measurement, what is that thing that you call the- The, the drought monitor. The, the drought yeah. monitor, uh, that, that would be really interesting to kind of think about for all of us, or the water usage uh, that you buy, the toilet that you buy, you could test. So I mean, I think there are there are programs out there that are that are helping us, each one of us, yes. to make better decisions. And I think that that to me is the hopeful part of all of this, because otherwise we can just go away into the desert and not come back. Well, eight days without water, and it's not going to work. No. <laughs> any any questions here? Any observations? Anyone? Yes. I can't hear you, sorry. Sorry, I... Yes. It's Vibia, V-I-B-I-A, and, and uh, it's on YouTube, and just to put in Vibia showers, and it's a really interesting little, um, uh, treatment because what they're doing is they're showing how to work on inventions that have happened elsewhere and converting those inventions to uh, a different area and then and then they're very sort of entrepreneurial which is really interesting so they're research minded design minded business minded and conservation minded and it's a really interesting example to think about. Uh, and, and not that uh, some of the shower heads that you talked about, the aeration and the, the misting and all of that, that, that exists already. But I think what they're using is a little bit uh, different. It's space technology. Yes. They're doing some space technology. If I'm not mistaken, I think they're using 0.5 gallons of water. Yes. So, which is really fascinating. So um, I was able to look at the video yeah, yeah. and see it. It was really... Um, uh, innovative and, and forward thinking, and um, I'm, I, I'm, I hope and wish them well. I hope that this comes out. It's uh, they're taking orders now, and it's a, a startup program, startup company. But That's right. um, uh, I think that it has the potential to save a lot of water. When you consider we're using, you know, 2.5 gallons of water in the standard EPA shower head today, um, and, and maybe there's some water sense labels, ones that are out there, we're using 1.75 or 1.5, but to go down to 0.5 is a significant savings. Right. So. Anyone else, any other questions? Well, you have to go out of here thinking that you can do something. What can you do? Use the cup when you brush your teeth. Use, uh, you know, I think if you can measure your, your water use somehow, you can document it, that would be really interesting too because you know the feedback mechanism. Feedback is always a really good thing. So if there's any feedback. Yeah. They do. Yeah. Yeah. You have a great resource right here. You really do. And you just have to ask them the question. What, tell me what your products can do to save water right. in the home. Whether it's a toilet, they're flushing just one gallon of water, um, or a, a, a lab faucet, or a shower faucet. Um, they're eager to show you their technology and why, um, and why it makes a difference and how it can save water. 
And I, I think that that is the hopeful thing here. And by the way, if they don't know or can't tell you, move on. Move on. It, uh, there's equally beautiful products elsewhere that do exactly what you want them to do. So I think you can, you can just vote with your feet, really, when you, when you uh, add, are at these shows. So John, keep up the good work. Thank you, you too. It's a pleasure and to talk to you this It's afternoon. really cool what you do. I love the, the uh, sort of venture into another world of, uh, of uh, water use. And uh, do you go to uh, uh, South America once in a while? I'm going back in February. And to the same place? I am, yeah. We finished, we just actually finished the, uh, 185 latrines in that community. So they had uh, fresh water that we provided for them, but they had no bathrooms. And um, so it's health and sanitation. And um, if you have clean water and, uh, and you don't soil the water and you can actually have a place to go to the bathroom in privacy and in decency. Um, so we're going back to look at our latrine project and look for another uh, project that we can do there um, water related. So. so what do you bring back as a kind of takeaway from that? Because that's a very, I mean, you did something really worthwhile. I mean, you do something worthwhile all the time with your clients, but that, that seems to be just like doctors without borders when they do surgery in Cambodia, they come away with their eyes gleaming because they were able to help and they weren't doing plastic surgery, but they were really fixing things. And so how, what do you come away with? Because that's a really interesting human experience that you have. Just this, I don't know, just the sense that I was able to help another human being and um, which, you know, it, why did I, why was I, why did God give me the ability to be born in the United States, in one of the richest, wealthiest countries? Um, I, I don't know, and I'm thankful for it every day. And so if I can go there and just spend a little bit of time and donate a little bit of money and resources, um, and you know, it's changed what I do and ha my perspective on ha what I offer my clients. So it's, it's um, what I think we help, I help them greatly. I, I, I gotta tell you, I think I come away with it much more impactful and much more beneficial for me than, than what we provide for them. And I think that's very beneficial <laughs> to them, so. Well, and also it teaches you about your business, yeah. about uh, what is absolutely necessary. And it's not, what is not a luxury, it's a necessity. It's a necessity. So you really learn that this is not something that is about, is like jewelry, it's, it's a life necessity. So how do we treat life necessities in a way that recognizes that that's what they are? And I think that's a really important question for all of us to be asking. So keep sitting. I know you've been on your feet all day, but thank you for being here and thank you for listening and thank you, John, for, for giving us your wisdom. Thank, thank you.